Hey everyone, this is Ian Miller of the Trip With Our Comics YouTube channel. Welcome. Tonight, we're going to talk about the other comic book projects that I've been a part of, such as Chronicles of Horror, Issues 1 and 2, Kaiju Mania, Batman Meets Godzilla, and Batman Enigma. But let's start with Chronicles of Horror first. Chronicles of Horror is a 16-page horror anthology series that was created by Matthew Myers and published by Sunova Comics. This project is heavily influenced by Alfred Hitchcock, George Romero, Ray Bradbury, and Rod Ster Sterling. One of the stories in the book is a story that I illustrated, which is entitled Samantha. In this three-page story, it's about a man that suffers increasingly violent mishaps on his way to meet his new girlfriend. It's almost as if someone put a hex on him. Foreshadowing something, maybe? Quite possibly. This project did so well on Kickstarter, we actually got issue two. Crocus of R. Stay tuned. There are 32 pages of pure horror in this issue. That means more twists, more gores, more things that go bump in the night. Okay. What, was that over the top? Come on. You can tell me. Anyway. The story that I illustrated in this particular issue was titled SciTech Consolidated. Where, in a world of new technology, an inventor is terrorized by his latest creation. This sounds like some serious, freaky f Frankenstein stuff. Crazy, right? What's crazy is that issue 2 did so well, we're actually doing issue 3 of Chronicles of Horror, which should be coming to you soon. You can actually purchase Chronicles of Horror issues 1 and 2 at SierraNovaComics.com. I have to tell you, it was so great working on this comic. Because it took me out of my own. Because, folks, I have to be honest. Horror is not my first love. It's not my forte. I enjoy the genre when it's good. But I'm not really a horror person. But I just couldn't resist working with some very talented people. Very talented creators. Everyone on the Sierra Nova Comics platform. And as an artist, you'd want a challenge. A different type of challenge, and this provided for me. But I have to tell you, it was great going back to familiar territory with the next few projects that I'm going to be talking about. The other Kickstarter that I was a part of is a monster anthology series entitled Kaiju Mania, which was published by 8th World Comics. I have to tell you, this comic has four monsters and four stories. Now, each of the story actually is, is, is separate. They're also connected into a much larger story set in the same universe. And what the craziest thing is, the story that, the story that I drew is actually the first story in the book. And that story involves a mysterious creature that escapes from a research facility and terrorizes a nearby city. Okay, all right, I'm just hearing myself. That was way over the top. I apologize, it will not happen again. Ugh. But, check out the very, the very cover that I did. Pretty cool, huh? I mean, seriously, does it look like a monster that you don't want to mess with? You know what other monsters you don't want to mess with? The King of the Monsters. That's right, you heard me, Godzilla. But he's about to meet the famous crime fight dynamic duo in Batman Meets Godzilla. Or Batman 66 meets Godzilla, as it's known in certain circles. Now some of you may be asking, how exactly did I get involved in this fan comic? 
Well, I was looking at Facebook posts and a Connecting with Comic Artists and Writers Facebook group, and I saw this ad, which had the words Batman and Godzilla. Well, obviously, I had to stop looking. I need to see what this is about. The writer, Eric Elliott, had actually created a fan f uh, comic script, which was actually based off an old William Dozer uh, treatment, which actually had a Batman-Godzilla crossover. This treatment was actually for a potential movie that was never realized. Because as many of you know, the Batman 66 movie that was released during the time of the television series was supposed to be a box office hit in order to pay for the expensive sets. However, the movie was not as box office hit as many had hoped. So the treatment was forgotten for many years, put on a shelf, and literally collected dust. Until Eric Elliott actually took the treatment and made it his fan comic. After the reading the basic plot of the story, I sent Eric some images of my work, and I have to tell you, I kid you not, five minutes later, five minutes later, I get a message from Eric saying, you're in, thank you. I was like, what just happened? See this face? That was my face when I read that email, that message. It was one of the few times that someone actually said yes to me. And I will say this for any up-and-coming comic book artists or writers. This is for your benefit. You will get rejections, especially from the big companies. But do not let those rejections discourage you, alright? Because eventually someone will say yes, so keep submitting. Because somebody will say yes. Anyway, I started work on Batman Meets Godzilla along with other artists. So once again, I was working with a group of talented people on a project that was just so much fun. It's crazy. It's crazy. But here's the thing. And I believe this is very much true in the comic industry, but this is very much true in real life. Communication is the key, people. You need to communicate with your team because things can get misunderstood. You cannot quite understand what the artist is trying to say. So communication with your team is very much the key. Not just in this business, but in all aspects of life. I have to tell you, I've been fortunate enough to work with such talented, great people. Not just on this project, but on Chronicles of Horror in Kaiju Mania. It's insane. We had to make sure the rest of the series was as good as issue one. So when we came to production on, if, on issue two of Batman Meets Godzilla, Eric came to me and said, Ian? Would you like to design a new Batmobile? A new Batmobile! A new Batmobile! Can you believe that? I was a kid at a candy store. Because, again, I was also a car buff, but I was getting to design an iconic car. The Batmobile. But, we wanted to make sure that it was not only different from the 66 Batmobile, which we all know and love, we want to make sure that they had the same line of continuity. So, we came up with this. As you can see, I kept the red bat emblem on the side of the car, on both doors, and the little red line that's on the uh, side of the car. Because I wanted to make sure that this was a Batman 66 Batmobile, not anything else. And it was a bit of a gamble, but it really worked because 
we had received so many, you know, comments from fans saying that they loved the new Batmobile. But we didn't just stop there. We actually did, I actually had got to design Batgirl's Bat Cycle. Now that was crazy. And here it is. Now, many of you know, the the original 60s Bat Batgirl cycle was a little bit dated. Okay, let's face it. It had doilies. Doilies! I understand what the producers were trying to do. They were targeting a certain, you know, certain age for teenage girls, but... Come on. Doilies? Anyway, it was a bit sexist, and we had to get rid of it. So, we ended up with this cooler design, a little bit sleeker, but we wanted to keep, you know, that imagery that was cool, that was about, that was cool from the original bike, but without the doilies. I have to say, it worked out pretty well because we got some very good raps about, about both vehicles, and people actually wished they had toys based on these vehicles. It's crazy. It's crazy. But, like I said, once again, I have been blessed with working with talented people. Now, I know many of you are asking about issue 3 of Batman Meets Godzilla. Well, I will say, I have handed in my pages for the issue, so my work is already done. You should be hearing about Batman Meets Godzilla issue 3 very soon. If you want to follow up on that, you can actually look at their Twitter account. Or, you can actually message me in the comments below to ask, where is Be where's the third issue? And hopefully, I'll be able to give you some answers. Which now brings us to the next uh, project in our segment, which is our, the last project. Batman Enigma. Which is actually the unofficial Tim Burton sequel to Tim Burton's Batman and Batman Returns. Now I know many of you are asking, does it we have another Batman sequel that we didn't hear of? Because many of you have actually have been reading Batman 89 miniseries from DC Comics. Let me just tell you, we had we did come first, we did do Batman Enigma before 89 was released. But you're also probably asking, how did this come to be? Well, let me tell you. It all started about 14 years ago. I was actually watching the making of Batman Returns. I was watching Tim Burton talk about potential ideas for the next sequel. But of course, the producers at the time, and they had their right to say this, they wanted to go in a different direction because they felt that the Batman Returns film was too dark for children. And they were getting complaints from parents. Many of you know this. At some point, this is Tim Burton's recollection, he actually said to the producers, you don't want me to do another one. They're like, no, no, it's not that. It was those words that cemented and killed an idea, the idea of a Tim Burton Batman 3 film. And eventually, director Joel Schumacher was brought in to replace Tim to do Batman Forever and Batman Robin. I have to tell you, I'm, no, I'm sure I'm not the only one. For a number of years, I actually was interested in a. I was interested about what that third film would have looked like. So, after doing some some research, I got a general sense of what the third film would have looked like. Riddler was definitely gonna be the villain. Robin was included, and the love of interest was a, a therapist. Now, some of those ideas were used for Batman Forever, but I wanted to go deeper than that. I wanted to go away from that. I wanted to actually create a story that was epic from the from the ground up, something that was on the same level as Batman Batman Returns. Because, because especially with Batman Returns, because there was a lot of story threads that they didn't cover in the later sequels. Was Batman, you know, 
cleared the, uh, the, his uh, supposed killing of the Ice Princess? Where did Catwoman go? These are some of the questions we need to ask and answer. We definitely need to answer them. So, I wrote a very simple story treatment. But, I decided that it was not the time for me to actually pursue it. So, I put it on a shelf and like collect dust. Then I launched full f full force into launching Triple Threat Comics and Codename Hunter. Along with my friend Eric Hernandez. But I still kept tweaking at the idea of Batman and Enigma. I kept tinkering with it. Then I heard that DC had passed, originally had passed on a Batman 89 miniseries. And yes, I will admit this was a little bit of arrogance of me. I said it like a certain Marvel villain would have said. Fine. I'll do it myself. I know. A bit arrogant. I didn't know how I was going to do it. But I laid, I left it on the shelf. I like collect dust. During the making of Batman Meets Godzilla, however, issue two, Eric had actually said to me, Ian, do you want to do more Batman stories with me? I said, sure. Why not? Eric Elliott is a great uh, guy. Great writer. Very great friend. I was like, why not? So he actually sent me a Sam Hamm script for Batman 2, which would eventually become Batman Returns. I believe it was either the first or second draft. I'm not really sure. But I actually read it over the weekend. And I liked it. I really did. I thought it was some very good stuff in there. It took it a completely different direction of, you know, of what it would eventually the finished film would become. But there was a lot of ideas that Sam had I liked. And he comes back and says, well, what do you think? This is Eric Gellick I'm talking about. And I said, Eric, it's a dynamite script. It's great. But you know what would be interesting? And that's the key. those are the words. You know what would be interesting? So I told him a brief uh, description of Batman Enigma, what I wanted to do for the series. And he just went with it. He just said, okay, let's do it. I was like, really? He's like, yeah. There's, there's so much potential here because we had to do original. We could do original story, and plus, this is something what the fans would want. And I had to remember, this was before Batman '89 was actually officially, you know, announced. We didn't know we were going to get a, a, a uh, Batman '89 mini series. We had no idea. So Eric and I had written the script based off the story treatment. And Eric is a brilliant writer, you know, he brought such wonderful ideas, story elements, brought characters into a real life, you know, gave it a real flavor. Now, casting was a bit tricky. We went through a couple of stages uh, of casting the right uh, actors to portray these uh, characters in comic book form. We wanted to get the likenesses right. Um, obviously, Michael Keaton... We needed to get that right. I wanted to make sure that his look would looked exactly like the comic. Exactly like him as well. Michelle Pfeiffer, no brainer. She had a look fantastic, but we also wanted to tweak her backstory a bit. Uh, Riddler, we went through a couple of ideas. Um, I was very far about getting Robin Williams for this, and so was Eric. I went with it a lot back and forth. We both went with it, you know, back and forth, saying, should we do Robin Williams as Riddler? Should we not? We ended up doing it because we felt he could have uh, played the character so great, you know, because Robin was such a terrific actor, and we thought he would have been perfect for this part. So it's just one of those what could have been situations, you know. Um, the Robin situation, you know, originally we were going to do Robin, but Eric had made the idea, presented the idea, what if he just was Nightwing, you know? What if we skipped the Robin origin? I was like, eh, this is an interesting idea. 
I don't think the fans will be mad about it. And it would also give the opportunity to give Marlon Wayne's his, you know, his Nightwing told because, it, as many of you have known, Marlon Wayne's was originally contracted to play Robin, but unfortunately, uh, Robin was excluded from Batman Returns, but Marlon was paid his salary in full. And, again, it's another one of those what-if moments, so we had to have Marlon Wayne in this comic. And we wanted to make sure that we got him down right and make sure that the Nightwing uh, situation was not going to be a problem for people and say, well, why isn't he Robin? We just felt that it would be much more interesting that way. And we'll explain why when we get to issue three. So... Aside from all of those uh, situations, it really came down to the story, what kind of story we wanted to tell. Because we wanted to include other villains, we wanted to include Scarecrow, and we actually used Nicolas Cage's likeness to, for his portrayal of Scarecrow, because I saw Nick Cage as Scarecrow. And this was mostly because of his uh, performance in Face Off. I was like, he could play that deranged, crazy, you know, type of character. And there's a little bit of Ghost Rider in there when, it was, uh, when we were writing the script. So we're using those influences to, to actually mirror uh, Nick Cage's performance when th our writing. And we also wanted to uh, include Harvey Dent in the story because he was greatly missed in Batman Returns. And this is the Billy D. Williams Harvey Dent. And I know plenty of people are asking, well, is it going to be Two-Face at issue 3? What's going to happen? I'm not telling you until you actually read issue 3. But I'll go more into that in a second. We actually made the conscious um, decision to actually do the comic in black and white and only have a few little colors in there. Because we wanted to create a different type of look. It was more along the lines of uh, Sin City, if you will. You know, that type of black and white uh, uh, world with very few colors, very muted uh, palette. But we also wanted to make sure that we add a, little, a few little Easter eggs from the original films. So when you get to issue three, you're going to see a few more of those Easter eggs. You've already started seeing them. You know, in issue one, issue two. I'm not going to say where you'll see them for sure, but trust me, uh, for those people that like to look for the Easter eggs, you got to have a blast with this. After the success of issue one, I was just floored by the response that we were getting. Eric, Eric, Eric was telling me that, you know, we were getting so many hits, so many comments, people were just loving what we were doing. I have to tell you, I never experienced that before. Never. It's It was either, neither on this project, neither on Batman Meets Godzilla. I never experienced something like that before. I was getting comments from people all over the world liking what we were doing. I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't. And, you know, it just made my excitement and also made, me, made us a bit eager to do issue two. Because like with Batman meets Godzilla, we, were make, we wanted to make issue two of Batman Enigma just as good as issue one. But we wanted more action in issue two, more, you know, Batman. And we actually introduced Arkham Asylum, you know, a bit more in issue two. And a few characters that you may have recognized, like Solomon Grundy. You recognized him, right? That was exciting. That was very really exciting to uh, add that character in there. But we also wanted to get more into the heart of the story. Because we were actually, we still, we actually are writing these fan comics as if we were writing movies. And... So far, the fans have been loving it, um, and I have to tell you, I'm very pleased with the results, and I know Eric and 
Paul Brian McCoy, who actually is our co-writer for issue two and issue three. I have to thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul, for coming onto the team uh, this late in the game. But I have to tell you, I have loved every single one of those comments, and I love that people are still loving this fan comic. Not just this one, but also Bad Moon Eats Godzilla. So I have to thank you guys uh, for supporting us and just loving what we're doing because we're just fans ourselves, you know? We're just telling this story just as fans. Now, I will say, before I get to issue 3 of Batman Enigma, I will talk about Batman 89 for, for, for a minute. I have to say, um, I was generally surprised that DC Comics actually announced Batman 89 as a miniseries. I was generally surprised, but it was a good surprise because finally, we were actually getting something, you know, official, you know? Don't get me wrong, I love what we're doing, you know? And so many fans are, are loving what we're doing. But again, another Batman 89 miniseries? I mean, come on! Who wouldn't be excited? Plus, you're getting the man himself, Michael Keaton, back in the bat suit. At the same time, this mini comic is being, this mini series is being announced. What's not to like? It was incredible. It was just incredible. We were enthusiastic, but of course, the fans were worried that it would deter us from actually completing Enigma. I actually wrote to one of the fans and said, "No." It would not deter us away from completing the story. Because it was our story, you know? And it's still not uh, deterring us away from completing our story. In fact, we're working on issue 3 right now. Now, I know fans of Batman are disappointed with the 89 miniseries file issue. I understand that. I will tell you that we have a completely different confrontation in mind for our final issue. I mean bigger, you know, bigger conflict which drives right to the heart of the fans, you know. I We want to deliver something that the fans would love with our final issue. I hope we're going to deliver to them, but we can't also take away from the success that the creators from Batman 89 have done, because they did it. They did it for real. You know, not to say that we didn't do it for real, but they did it in official capacity and in a, I'd say, a relatively short amount of time. I know there was a couple of delays with issues, but that was just to get their story right. But that's the thing. That's their story. We have our story. Now, when I say our story is canon, no. I wouldn't say our story is canon. But I wouldn't say their story is canon, canon either. Because it's just, they're both just what-if comics. And that's the beauty about it. Because you can have different versions of, of, this, of this Batman story. So, I actually would like to let you guys decide which, which one you think is canon. But, because it's not up to me. This is just a story that, that I've been wanting to tell for 14 years, and I've had talented people help me tell it. By the end, whatever is official, that's up to you. But I have to thank each and every one of you for supporting us in both Batman Enigma and also Batman Meets Godzilla because we're doing this for you. Because we're your fans and we just love telling these stories. Now, what's the future going to bring for either one of these universes. For example, you're probably asking, are they going to do more Batman stories set in the Burtonverse? Well, that's up to you. I mean, yeah, we, we have a few stories in mind for for Batman set in the Burtonverse, but in the end, this is up to you, the fans. Write to us and let us know if you're interested in seeing more sequels. 
But in the end, it's up to you. But like I said, I have to thank each and every one of you, the fans, who are all over the world that, that have been supporting us and just loving what we're doing. Because, like I said, we're fans ourselves. And we try to think in each and every one of you when we actually do these comics. Well, like I said, what does this hold for the future? Well, we definitely want to do more Batman stories in the Burdenverse. But again, that's up to you if you want us to do that. But we also have a, we also have some ideas to go into the Snyderverse, which I'll be talking about very soon. I can't talk about anything yet, but we are venturing into the Snyderverse. So keep an eye out for when we actually talk about that. I may actually talk about that in a future episode. But, like I said countless times, I thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart because this is 14 years in the making, 14 years to get off this story off my chest, and to having very talented people like Eric Elliott and Paul Brian McCoy to help me tell this story. So, issue three is going to be a little bit emotional for me because it's a story that I've always wanted to tell. So, there's that to look forward to, and I'm very excited for you all to see our hard work. But, as always, thank you for your continued support. So, uh, for next week's episode, we're actually going to have Eric Hernandez, my very good friend Eric Hernandez, the co-founder of Trevor Thread Comics and the creator of Soul Racer on, along with Enrique Lopez, another great friend of mine, and Inker Extraordinaire, to talk about what we're going to do for Trevor Thread Comics going forward, and also talk about a few of the comic giants that we have lost recently. Talk about our personal stories, our personal interactions with them, and also how they've influenced their, how they've influenced our work. So there's that to look forward to. Well, that's all we have for this week. I'm Amy Miller, and this is the Triple Threat Comics YouTube channel. Have a good night, folks. Also, be sure to actually follow us on our social media accounts, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And if you'd like to follow us on YouTube, just hit that like button and subscribe.